Okay. Oh, sorry. So I'm halfway through. So another way of saying that is that there's still half the semester to go. It can be kind of an issue when people hit midterm and figure we're about finished. I hope you'll continue to attend regularly and keep turning in assignments and doing all the stuff you were doing. So we ideally would have had a test this week, but I did not announce it over the break. So we'll do it early next week. I think Tuesday gives you the 75 minutes. Um, but for now, We're in the chapter 10. And um, calculus 2 is kind of weird. I mean, ideally, a class you take should kind of build on itself throughout the semester. Calculus 2 is two basically unrelated topics, sort of grafted together. So we've spent a lot of time looking at integrals. Now we'll look at something else. And the something else we're going to look at is infinite series, infinite sums. And we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about why they're important. But in 10.1, we're just going to lay some preliminary groundwork. And we're going to talk about sequences. And in English, Sequences and series are sort of the same thing. You can talk about a sequence of events or a series of events. In math, they're very different. A sequence is nothing that's likely to frighten anyone too much. A sequence is a list of numbers. And at least traditionally, when you're talking about sequences, you're talking about infinite lists of numbers. So, I mean, you can have any kind of sequence you start somewhere and then you count up. I mean, the, the positive counting numbers, or I guess I should say natural numbers because we're including zero, that's a sequence. Um, or we could have the sequence of perfect squares. Or we could have the sequence of prime numbers. Any list of numbers is a sequence. There are I mean, a few ways you can describe a sequence. I mean, sort of the easiest way, I guess, is just, well, to literally describe it. This sequence is the sequence of prime numbers. 
But um, in this context, there are other ways that we're more likely to be describing a sequence. And I'll give two of them. So one way we can describe a sequence is recursively. This isn't something we'll be looking at so much in this class. It's really important when you're doing like computer algorithms, for example. <laughs> and a recursive sequence is when a member of a sequence is defined in terms of the earlier members. I'm um, frequently the member of the sequence will just be defined in terms of the number right before it, but you can have other recursive sequences as well. So <clears throat> I said that this shows up a lot in computer algorithms or algorithms in general. Let's try to cast our mind back. Way back to couch to this one, when we introduced a root finding method called Newton's method. And the idea of that, we're trying to find a root. We select a number that's maybe kind of near the root. We go up here. We draw in the tangent line and we get a new number. And the hope is that the new number is closer to the root than the old number. So we started with a number x1. We used it to define a new number, x2. Now that we know what x2 is, we can use it to define a new number x3. Now that we know what x3 is, we can use it to define a new number x4 and so on. So we use each number to find a new number and we're generating this list of numbers x1, x2, x3, x4, and we can, I mean, keep doing this forever and generate a sequence of numbers. And every number is defined in terms of the numbers that come before it. If I haven't actually used Newton's method recently, but if my memory is not acting up, which I don't think it is, Here's the formula for use for Newton's method. So you see, if we want to know the nth element of the sequence, we have to know the n minus one element of the sequence. And we also need 
a starting point. That's traditionally called a guess, although in general, you're not really guessing, you're making an, an informed decision, let's say. Um, so that's an example of a recursive definition. There is a very famous sequence Maybe one of you will have heard of it. Does the Fibonacci sequence ring bells? So the Fibonacci sequence is also recursive. So I saw some nods. What's the, how is the Fibonacci sequence defined? What's the pattern here? You add the number before. You add the numbers before. So here we have two sort of initial conditions instead of one. And then we use these two initial conditions, we add them together, and we get two. And then two plus one is three. Three plus two is five and so on. So the nth element of the sequence is the element of the sequence before it, thus the element of the sequence even before it. So here's an example where you have a recursive definition and an element of the sequence isn't just defined in terms of the element before it, it's defined in terms of the two elements before it. And I mean, you could, you could create a Fibonacci-like sequence that goes even further. So here, we're defining an element of the sequence to be all of the previous numbers added together. <laughs> There is a way, give me a second, I need to think how this would. Yeah. You can define um, the factorial in a recursive way, but we'll leave that be, I think. So the Fibonacci sequence is kind of a curiosity, I think. I mean, there's a there's a surprising amount of kind of mysticism in math. The idea people have that you know you have these things and they show up in everywhere, and you know the golden ratio is in the Great Pyramid or whatever, and some of it might be true. I don't think most of it is true. So I don't know if the Fibonacci sequence really has quite the importance that that you know websites sometimes give it, but. Stuff like this is a really critical application of recursive sequences.
Um, a thing about recursive sequences, which may be kind of obvious if you think about it, but because Because the elements are of a recursive sequence are defined in terms of previous elements, if you want to know some element of a sequence, x sub n, you need to know the earlier elements of the sequence. As I say, when I when I put it like that, it probably sounds kind of banal. I mean, that's the definition of recursive. Um, it's a sad fact, though. I mean, if you look again at Newton's method, I mean, the point of Newton's method is that these numbers are getting closer and closer to the root. So x sub 10,000 is going to be closer to the root than x sub 1. Um, so it would be nice if we could just tell you what x sub 10,000 is and not bother with these other x's. But of course, that's not how recursive sequences work. If we want x sub 10,000, we have to start with one and work our way up. That's why I keep using the phrase computer algorithm. I mean, in theory, we could do Newton's method by hand. We probably made you do a few examples in calculus one, but really because of this, you're doing so many operations to get from here to here, that you really need a computer to do it for you. So that's the idea of a recursive sequence. Um, there was something very important in Newton's method. We'll come back to it. The idea that this sequence is approaching a number. Before we get to that, Another way of defining a sequence is using a formula. If you want to know the nth element of the sequence, you can just plug n into some kind of well, formula, I'm, I'm repeating myself a little. So maybe we know that a sub n is negative one to the nth power times n squared divided by n factorial. A terrible looking formula, which somehow we're going to see sequences like this, and they're not going to be just stuff we make up to torment you. They're going to appear in very important applications. But here, if we want, you know, the well, the 10,000th element of a sequence. 
we don't have to find the other elements of the sequence. We can just stick 10,000 right in and get whatever we get. And I mean, what we probably get more or less is, is positive one. Um, we can try this on a calculator. I think our calculator is going to see 10,000 factorial and freak out at us, but let's, uh, let's see. Or rather, I said I thought this was about one. I don't. I think this is very close to zero. So negative one to the ten thousandth times ten. No, let's let's not do that. There we go. Times. 10,000 squared divided by a uh, factorial is hiding here somewhere. Here we are under probability. Yeah, our calculator is uh, not as smart as we are. It's nice to be able to say that. It just looks at this, it sees this 10,000 factorial and says, well, this is such an enormous number. I'm just going to give you an error message. We can think this through and say, well, 10,000 squared is you know, not some huge number. I mean, I guess it's kind of big in day-to-day -day life, but, you know, from our calculator's point of view, it's not a big number. So we have this kind of small number divided by a number so big our calculator can't express it. A small number divided by a big number is close to zero. Um, incidentally, this is going to be important way down the line. Does everyone here know what the factorial is? Is this, uh, I'm seeing shaking heads, so. Fly by every number before. You are exactly correct, but let me put it on the board. Um, so the reason I said that the factorial is kind of recursive is that, you know, n factorial is defined in terms of the numbers that come before it. All of the numbers that come before it get multiplied together. One factorial is one, and then this is one of these things that never seems very satisfying, but in order for a bunch of formulas from probability to work, zero factorial is defined in this very kind of 
artificial way, zero factorial is defined to be one. So that's the factorial. The factorial gets big very quickly. I mean, if we look at X, not matrix, let me get back. Here we go. If we create the table of values, here we are. So zero factorial is one, as I said, even though it's sort of strange. One factorial is one, then two, six, 24, 120. So you see that by nine, we've reached three digits. Thirty factorial is about is two followed by thirty two zeros, and then at some point here at seventy um sixty nine factorial was one followed by ninety eight zeros, and at seventy factorial we have reached the uh, limits of our calculator's ability to store numbers this large. So, anyway, as I say, factorial show up a lot in probability. They also show up a lot in calculus, as we're going to find out. Um. A sequence might approach a number. This is an idea that we sort of started talking about here. You know, I said, well, the hope of Newton's method is that as the sequence goes on, these numbers are getting closer and closer to the root. It's a root binding method. So we can, we'll, we'll re retain this notation and terminology that we've been using using the limit notation, the limit terminology. And if a sequence approaches a number, we'll say that the limit as n goes to infinity of that sequence is that number. Let's go back to negative one to the n, times n squared over n factorial. And let's get into our calculator and we can, let's see, is there any way to just to get back to the top? <laughs> So our calculator requires us to call nx because this is just the one variable button that it that it always has, but negative one to the x times x squared divided by x factorial. Go once again to the table. So 
It might not be immediately obvious because we're switching from positive to negative as we go down the table. But if you just look at these numbers, 2, 1.5, 0 0.66, 0 0.2, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. These numbers are getting extremely close to zero as we go down this list. Like by the time we reach 30, so 2e to the negative 45, so that's zero point then 44 zeros, then a two. So just looking at this sequence on our calculator. The limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence appears to be a zero. Let's see. Um, a sub n equals arc tangent of n. So this is the definition of a sequence. Um, a sequence, by the way, sometimes you sort of talk about it starting at zero. Sometimes you start about it talking at starting at one. So sometimes you think of a sequence like this. Other times, you think of it as starting at one. Um, there is no real convention to this. It's just sort of, in some examples, people usually start at zero. In other examples, people usually start at one. Some programming languages will start at zero, no problem. Other programming languages want to start at one, but But because it's a little ambiguous, it's very normal to give the formula for a sub n and then to write something like this. So your reader can look at it and say, all right, you're starting at one and going up. So this is another thing we'll just, I shouldn't say just, but again, we can look at, let's see if I quit this table and come back. No, is there a way? Well, I guess I'm manually scrolling back up. So if we define, where is it? It's hiding here, the arc tangent of X. And we once again, just look at this table. It looks as if as N goes up. Now it's not totally obvious what's happening, but certainly it doesn't look like this is going to infinity or anything. It looks like it's reaching 1.5 something and then kind of staying put. You see, and we go up far enough, and this is rounding error. Um, I mean, we haven't actually reached 1.566, but there we go. You see, we seem to be around 1.56 something. And what's happening here 
is that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n here is pi over two. That's what that decimal was trying to get at. Um, how do I know that this limit is pi over two? Well, the sequence is defined in terms of the arc tangent. And this is maybe one of these things where we don't actually remember what the arc tangent looks like, but the arc tangent has a horizontal asymptote at pi over two. As we go to the right, as n goes to infinity, the arc tangent of n is approaching pi over two. <laughs> so if you look at sort of the argument I made, a sub n is the arc tangent of n. If we think of the arc tangent of n as a function, the limit as n goes to infinity is pi over two. And the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence is pi over two. That is hardly likely to be a coincidence. Give people a moment to write. So when we have a sequence that's defined in this way, so a sequence that's defined in terms of a function. And we want the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence We can find that limit by taking the limit as n goes to infinity of the function. <clears throat> um, the textbook phrases it a little differently because the textbook wants to call the function f of x. I don't mind letting n be our variable, so I can phrase it in a slightly more simple manner than the textbook does. And um, a whole lot of L'Hopital's rule is what we usually get when we are looking at these examples. So in the examples we're get, look, going to look at, most of the time the limit is going to exist. Most of the time the limit is going to be zero. And a lot of the time, at least, we can find the limit using L'Hopital's rule. And again, I sort of mentioned it when we talked about L'Hopital's rule, but I think that's why that material gets covered in calculus too. It's a limit rule. You only need the derivative to talk about it. We could present it in calculus one, but calculus two is where we're really going to use it.
So we'll define a sub n to be n squared over e to the n. And let's find the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n. So let I I feel like I use great as kind of a actual phrase. This isn't really a trick exactly, but I'm just going to treat this as a function as n. I'm going to treat as a variable as n goes to infinity n squared and e to the n both go to infinity. So this is indeterminate. It's L'Hopital's rule. This is still indeterminate. Top and bottom still going to infinity. Hit it with L'Hopital's rule again. This is no longer indeterminate. A constant divided by infinity. is zero. So there are, I mean, L'Hopital's rule doesn't always work. Um, in particular, we don't, we can't use L'Hopital's rule when a factorial shows up because we can't take the derivative of a factorial. But a lot of times, if we're trying to find these limits, it's going to end up as a L'Hopital's rule problem. Um, let's We won't really be working heavily with factorials for a few sections, but let's try to find the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n factorial. Well, this is indeterminate, certainly. But again, um, we can't use L'Hopital's rule because n factorial doesn't have a derivative. For at least for our purposes, n factorial doesn't have a derivative. So a lot of times working with factorials is going to amount to doing some kind of cancellation. In the top, we have n. In the bottom, we have n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. All the way down to 1. So what happens here? Don't oversimplify this. I'm just, or <laughs> that's the opposite of what I meant to say. Don't overcomplicate this. I All I'm trying to get at is that the n in the top and the n on the bottom cancels. How can we write this compactly? 
Well, if n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 and so forth. Could you just call it n minus 1 factorial? That's exactly what it is. Thank you. And now we'll need to develop a little intuition about factorials. But what we've seen already is that they go to infinity very, very quickly to the extent that the calculator starts giving overflow errors at around 70. So this is zero. And this is sequences, and it's going to be sort of very similar to, to what we saw first with the derivative, then with the integral, where this thing we really care about, you know, will define in terms of simpler stuff, will define infinite sums in terms of sequences, and then we'll move away from sequences and just start looking at infinite sums. In the same way that when we were doing integration, you know, we introduced the Riemann sums, but by the time we got to integration by parts, for example, we weren't really looking at the Riemann sums anymore. So I have um, this section and another section scheduled for this week. The other section is long, but my assumption is that we might be doing test review on Thursday. So I'll find an old test, get it posted in the announcements of Canvas. And yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to do that this evening, but in any event, I will see you tomorrow. Right and early.